Hello and welcome to the third part of this course, System Administration 1. Uh, up until now we have talked and talked and talked and you have read a lot about different theories uh, and produced some uh, reports. Now you will get your hands dirty and start installing some things. Uh, before we do that, uh, we need to learn some things about the installation process. Uh, we tried this out <coughs> uh, last time. We have some technical difficulties with how to react with students who are not in the classroom. Uh, we will try it again this time and I have refined the methods and hopefully it will work better. Uh, so we will start with one uh, question. <laughs> Is this working for you? <laughs> uh, does these questions feel like you are more active during the lecture. So go to this link below or use the QR code. Uh, I will, you will get some seconds to do that before I push out the question. This it works. It's <coughs> maybe not so hard, uh, easy to see, uh, but this is the result. Most of you think that it's a good thing, so uh, we will try it out and uh, we'll see if we continue doing it. Uh, so this lecture we will talk about server OS installation, what you should think about before you do an installation, what type of media you will have and how we can do this. Then we will go on until how to manage your servers, how win Windows and Linux systems differ, uh, and if we should use the CLI-based or a GUI-based uh, management. Um, and the last part will be about post setup uh, to get the system up and running with networks and updates and security. So before we can start the installation, uh, we have to consider some things. And these are the three main points which operating system should we run, uh, on what hardware, and where should we run it. And there are some factors on each of these uh, points. Uh, they apply to all. So when you're looking on the operating system, what is the purpose of the server? What are you going to use the server for? Is it for multipurpose? Are you going to use it for uh, a lot of different services? Well, maybe then you should choose some uh, operating system. Uh, compatibility, is the application uh, capable to run on that operating system? You have to consider that. Cost is always a factor. Uh, and the last the part of the factors, the knowledge is quite a big one, actually. If your team of engineers and technical personnel is not familiar with the, the hardware or the operating system, you shouldn't choose that one. And you will have some big problems uh, afterwards. Um, so how do we choose the operating system? Linux and Windows are quite different from each other. Uh, I think we should have a discussion about these different points on the difference between them. Uh, I think you can go back to the, the Pingu system and you will answer these. And then when I will have a discussion about what about I think you're correct. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you will address these as, you will get a question. I could put it up now. You have two minutes for the first one. Uh, Let's see. Two minutes. Uh, um, yes. So the, the first one is about hardware uh, requirements. You think that the hardware requirements are high or low or medium for Windows and for Linux. So you can choose uh, both here. Uh, so just choose one for the Windows and one for the, the Linux system. So just talking about the hardware requirements. Do you think that the Linux system use, 
just less hardware requirements or more. Hmm? Is the mic on? Yes. Uh, so you won't see the graph here. I haven't uh, managed to get that to work, but uh, most none of the you thought that Windows has high hardware requirements to run. Uh, I would say that it's quite high uh, requirements to run Windows on a, on a server. Uh, all is re relative, of course, but uh, uh, in comparison to to Linux, they are much higher. Uh, the Linux system, well, it depends on the system, of course. You have a lot of different distribution of Linux. Uh, some uses more hardware, uh, or more, uh, uh, you has to have more uh, hardware uh, than other systems. Uh, you can run the minimum requirements for Windows uh, Server 2012 is around 500 megabytes of RAM, and you need around 40 gigs of hard disk space. So that's quite high, I think. You can run a Linux server on 150 megabytes of ROM, something like that, the minimum requirements. Uh, so when it's coming to getting started, how do you think it's easier or not easy to start with the system? Um, I think we will manage with just uh, one minute here. So do you think it's Easy or hard to start out with Linux and uh, and Windows systems? The question uh, will bear there now. Okay, here you are more um, thinking alike uh, and thinking like me. Uh, Windows is quite easy, and why is that? Well, usually you have a, a graphical interface with Windows uh, and. Uh, with the services that are included with the operating system. The operating system also includes a lot of features that help the user to getting started. Uh, in Linux, especially if you install it just with the, with the CLI version, so you have to type commands, then it will be quite hard. And the threshold for coming into the system is quite hard. Um, and I, that is what you have uh, answered also. Uh, coming to stability, uh, you will only get 30 seconds for this. I think you, you will manage. And uh, this is you rated at uh, high, medium, and low, and uh, as you did with the first one. So it should be up now. Okay. So the majority of your thinking that. Uh, the window system is about medium and high in stability, and in Linux, the same, about the same. Uh, and this is a hard question, of course. What is stability? Uh, how do you rate that? Uh, in history, Windows has uh, uh, haven't been that of a stable system, some would say. Uh, so uh, my uh, I was thinking that you should uh, maybe rate wi Windows badly here, but I think in nowadays the operating system is quite stable. It depends on the administrator, of course. How will he set up the system? If he uses bad drivers or something like that, then he will have an unstable system. The biggest problem that Windows had uh, was bad drivers, and the drivers wasn't, the, the, most of the drivers wasn't written by Microsoft people. It was written by third-party uh, people. Um, so I think when we talk about functionality, we'll do the, the same thing here. Uh, it's, and what do I mean about functionality? Well, what is built into the system? Do you think that a Windows system has a lot of functionality built in? Uh, then you will s score that as high. Or if you think that Linux system uh, has a medium, then you choose medium. I think we should uh, take 30 seconds for this one too. Uh, here, most of you think that Windows has a high or medium in the functionality department. And you're not, uh, well, medium I would say, you think about Linux. Uh, when you, when you 
talk about the difference between Linux and system, we usually say that Windows is more of a full-featured server operating system. A lot of services are included uh, and built into the system. So they have a DNS server, they have a web server, they have a DSTP server, a lot of services that are built in to the server that you can use. With the Linux system, usually you have to rely on some third-party application. Uh, so in Linux, uh, if you download Ubuntu or something like that, and it will ask you, uh, do you want a DNS server? Well, that won't be a part of the uh, Ubuntu system. It will be a third-party application, probably Bind or something like that. So that's not built into the system. So <coughs> that may differ. Some distribution may, uh, of Linux may include a lot of services. Uh, but this is more general speaking. So security, uh, I think we we'll skip that and I just say that for nowadays the security is quite high on both of these systems. Lin Linux has special distributions that are built for just security, so they should be really secure. But Windows nowadays are quite secure. If you go back to older MT systems or even 2000, Windows 2000, a lot of services were um, on by default when you installed the system, and that's not recommended, of course, because then you have a, even if you don't use a web server, it could be on by default and the administrator didn't know that, and that will make the system more vulnerable for, uh, for hackers, of course. Uh, but nowadays, uh, quite not, no big features are on by default. You have to uh, activate the feature uh, when you want to, want to uh, use them. Uh, when it comes to support, uh, well, as you know, a Windows system, you buy a license, and in that license is some support included. You can buy extra support if you want to do that, but uh, the main uh, support are included. In most Win Linux distribution, you have to buy the support. That is how many of them uh, get money, actually. Um, but around Linux is a big community of people who want to help each other. So for the most part, you can get help even not paying for it. Uh, and a lot of Linux distribution has to make money on something, so they build extra features that they sometimes uh, make you pay for. How many know what TCO stands for? Somebody in the classroom or somebody on the internet. It's very quiet out there. <laughs> so for total cost of ownership, have you heard the term before? Uh, that's when you include all the costs for something uh, during its time. Uh, so if you install a Windows server, then you should include all the costs that you have for that operating system until you retire it. And so here is the question, actually, what, is a Linux system more expensive than a, than a Linux system? Well, I would say, for the most part, yes, it is. Uh, but Linux system for enterprises are not uh, free. If you want to use Red Hat or something like that, then you will pay uh, support, uh, for the support and stuff like that, and that will cost quite a lot. Uh, so the TCO are are not nothing on none of these systems. You want to use them uh, for your business. Okay, so now that we have chosen an operating system, then we can have different types of installation. These are just terminology that you may have heard of. Uh, an unattended, an attended installation is the one when you're sitting in front of a computer and making choices during the installation. Uh, I think that's, if you have done some uh, one OS installation, then that would be the one probably. Uh, the unattended version is when you have uh, made a, a file with the options of how do you want the operating system to, uh, to be installed. The name of the server, uh, some other configuration. You have that in the file, and when you load up the, the installation uh, program, then you will include that file, and the system will keep on going without you having to uh, 
uh, make any choices. So how is that different from a silent installation? Well, a silent installation is when you don't see anything on the screen. That, that can be an, an unattended installation, probably is. You will get the file, but you don't see anything. If you talk about ma malwares, stuff you don't want on your computer, they will be silent installation. You will not see anything, they will just install. Uh, and uh, no OS can be silent also. A headless installation is when you don't have a monitor connected. It's usually combined with an unattended installation, so you don't have to be there. Uh, you can't see any messages coming up on the screen. Uh, you can have an attended installation with a headless installation, but then you have to uh, have some networking uh, devices connected to it so you can see what happens. Then we have automated installation. That could seem like an unattended installation, but in an automated installation, you usually also have more configuration and program that are being automated uh, installed when the operating system is done. Uh, clean installation is something that you may have heard of. That is when you don't upgrade a, uh, a, pre, uh, a system uh, or when you have a clean hard disk with nothing on. And the network, well, it's self-explanatory. It's when you have the, the installation files on a server and the computer will connect to that server and, and uh, install via the network. So we have one question here about which installation media you have been using, if you have been using uh, some uh, to install. This doesn't have to be a server operating system. This can be any uh, operating system, actually. So we will take uh, one minute. Now you should have it open. So I think it's quite hard to see. I'm sorry for that. I will do something about it to the next one. <coughs> but this is the result. Uh, CD and DVD uh, is the highest one. Uh, but also a USB drive and, and uh, ISO file. So that's good. Uh, so. Typically, when you're talking about installation media, this is where the, the operating system is before you install it on, on the physical or the virtual server. Uh, <clears throat> typically, you use CD and DVD or USB drive when you're installing on a physical server. Um, when we have virtualized hardware, we usually use an ISO, and that is just an, an image of a C CD or DVD. Uh, and we can use a template. Uh, did we talk about template during the seminar? No, we didn't. Uh, a template is a, a pre-configured machine. You have installed the operating system. Maybe you have uh, put in the, the device drivers and other things. And then you make a, a template of that, sort of a snapshot of that machine. And then you store it. They're usually also called image. But the problem with the, the word image is that you usually do the uh, talk about that when you're talking about the ISO uh, also. Uh, but this is a file. Uh, and in a virtualized environment, then you can make a clone of that template. And you will have a new machine with that exact, exact uh, configuration. Uh, some templates also uh, can be sysprepped. You say that the system has been prepared for uh, that it's a, a template. So when you start up for the first time after a clone, then it will make some uh, steps to make that a, a more uh, unique system. So uh, specific IDs and MAC addresses for the network card don't, uh, it, it shouldn't be the same as the template. Because if you make 10,000 machines of that template, they will uh, not work together because you have the same IDs on the machines. Uh, so that's about the installation media. Uh, the next thing we'll talk about is managing your server. The installation process is 
qu quite easy on both of these systems. Uh, tomorrow we have scheduled a, a, a class that's just a, a demo. Uh, I think it's, is it a 10? Yeah, I think so, T 10 to 11. That's not an, an ordinary lecture. I will just stand here and installing a Windows system and a Linux system and making them uh, talk to each other. Uh, but <clears throat> now we'll talk about the difference in how to manage your servers. Uh, and, and Linux system comes in a lot of flavors or distributions. And they all have their different things, so they're not unique and the same. Some things may be the same on the different Linux system, but not all things. With Windows, we are usually a very familiar interface. It doesn't change that much between releases. Uh, and I, I won't go into how to choose a um, uh, Linux distribution, because that's quite a big topic. But uh, in this course, I would recommend that you use Ubuntu, uh, so we use the same. But you can use anything you want, actually. Um, another thing that differs uh, is the graphical user interface. Uh, in Windows system, they're quite the same, but even in the same distribution of Linux, you can have different uh, desktop environments or different GUIs. Uh, so these are just some that you can install. Um, so they will look quite different from each other. There are some here that actually make them look more like a Windows system if you prefer them to look like that. Uh, when it comes to managing the system from the, the text mode interface, or CLI, the Windows has this old <laughs> program called CMD, a command prompt, uh, which most of you probably will have been in sometimes. Uh, but a couple of years ago, or maybe 10 years ago, they developed this new Windows PowerShell. Um, I mean, I will talk about that in a bit. In Linux, you have a lot of different CLIs that you can use to manage your system. Uh, the most common is Bash. And I think you've been using Bash during uh, um, this program before. Uh, and I would recommend you using Bash. Uh, when it comes to managing the server and the services that are running on your server, uh, then in Windows we have a program called MMC, uh, which is a, a sort of a console. It's, it's called the Microsoft Management Console. Uh, it's to make, it's a console that you can load in snap-ins to administer uh, different parts of the system. So they have this familiar uh, graphical interface that has snap-ins that can be loaded. And these snap-ins can be third-party developed for different for their servers if they want to. Um, and if you want to, a lot of them also have uh, PowerShell commandlets that, uh, that you can use to uh, manage the system. In Linux, it depends very much uh, for the task. But m most of them have some sort of CLI that you can write commands to, and it will uh, do that. So should we manage our system with the GUI or the CLI? Here we have a table. Uh, my thought here was that you should answer, but I think you have been answering quite a lot of questions. So. Uh, when it comes to ease of use, of course, the, the GUI is, is more easy. Uh, you have more explanatory uh, text to help you make the right choice. Uh, in a CLI, you have to know the command, you have to know the arguments uh, to make it do what you want to. When it comes to speed, of course, the, the, the CLI will be faster if you know the command. Otherwise, you will have to find the program that you want to configure, and you have a lot of different paints and uh, uh, options. With the CLI, you have one command, and it will be faster. And when it comes to multitasking, doing more things at once, 
I would give it to the, the, the GUI most of the time because if it takes some time processing power to, to configure this, then you can do and make other stuff during that part. Uh, if you're in the console, well, you can open another tab and start doing things there. But I would say that for, for multitasking, the, the graphical interface will be better most of the time. Scripting, well, of course, it's hard to script a, a graphical user interface. Uh, remote access, uh, also very easy, uh, especially in in a Linux system where, you, where we use SSH. It's quite easy to remote access and making commands. PowerShell has the same ability, but it's it's quite hard to set up uh, if you want to access the system uh, from the internet anyway. History. In most graphical user interface, if you uh, tick a, a checkbox and then hit save, and then you make a lot of other settings, uh, it's hard to know when and how you did the different steps. With uh, the CLI, you can have a history of the commands that you have done. Uh, so that is uh, a big advantage, I think. And when it comes to using the resources, the graphical interface will use more power of the computer. Uh, it will have to uh, render the, the graphical interface and it will use more resources. So as you see here, I'm <coughs> a guy that likes to use a CLI. Uh, let's see what time we have. Okay. So when we come to, to Linux servers, uh, we have the bash, the born again shell, uh, and it's both a shell program and it has its own scripting language. So when you install a Windows a, a Linux server and uh, it, it's a server version that doesn't have a graphical interface, the first you will see is probably a prompt with the bash running. And bash itself is just a program. Uh, it is the default shell in, in most of the Linux system, not all. It's also the default, default shell in, in uh, Apple uh, OS X. And it has a lot of different features, uh, as you can see here. You have functions and arrays and uh, yeah, a lot of different things. Uh, Autocompletion is very handy in the beginning when you don't know the commands a full name. So here's a question. How many built-in commands does Bash have? So this is the result. Uh, most of you think that it's over 100. Uh, and the key here is built-in. Uh, oh, not that one because these are the built-in commands. It's around 40. But you have to remember that a command is either an executable file or a built-in to the shell. And a lot, a Bash uh, depends on a lot of programs that are already installed on the system or executable files that do that. So if you Maybe you thought that apt-get or something like that was a command that's built into the shell, but it's not. It's, a di it's an own program that's run. Uh, you can't really, by just typing the command, you don't know if it's a built-in or if it's an, an external program. And you don't have to know that. So these are some shortcuts that I think that you will have to learn to uh, be able to use the command line. Uh, the first one <coughs> and the second one uh, seems why you need to know that. But if you type a long command and then you try to run it and you realize, oh, I misspelled something, then it's really hopeless to step on the, the forward and backward keys to get to the front and the back. Uh, usually you have this page, uh, home and end button that are linked to the same. But uh, sometimes you don't have those buttons if you don't have a full-size keyboard. 
So then uh, control plus A and control plus E is very useful. Um, and most of you probably didn't know that you have an undo uh, command, a shortcut. Uh, the fourth one here is really good to have. Uh, and the tab key, of course, that's really useful to have auto completion. Uh, the auto completion doesn't work on everything. Uh, it works usually on the command itself. And some of them have that the arguments also have tab completion, but not all of them. Um, another useful command that you probably didn't know is the control R. Uh, if you type control uh, R, then you will get a new prompt where you can search the history of the commands that you've been using. Uh, <coughs> and you have the exclamation part where you can run, repeat the last command. And probably one that you have been using is control C to abort the, the currently running uh, process. Or if you have written a lot of text uh, and you realize I want to empty the, the, the prompt, then you can use that also. So I've collected some good reads um, about Bash. And uh, the best way to start, I think, is the reference mod manual, of course. It's really good. And uh, then we have a tutorial written by the four developers in three parts. I have put this on the, the course homepage also, of course. Uh, and, well, you won't, you won't read through the, the reference mod manual uh, and then just learn everything. You will use that as a reference manual. You go to it when you're stuck and you don't know the command or something like that. Uh, here at the end, we have some good examples. It could be good uh, to just uh, shimmer through to maybe orient to what can I do with this, with this bash, this shell. So uh, I encourage you to go through these. I think we will have a 10 minute break before we go into Windows PowerShell. Okay, uh, let's continue with uh, how to manage your server, Windows Server, uh, with the CLI. And then we have PowerShell. Well, you can use the old command line to doing some stuff, but if you're really going to manage your server, then you should use Windows PowerShell. Uh, as Bash, it's both a command prompt and a script language. Uh, they have a, a different approach. Here you have uh, commandlets, uh, which are components that can be loaded into to PowerShell. Uh, and when you run PowerShell, then they have built some built-in commandlets that are preloaded into to the command prompt. Uh, so you can use. And the big difference here that it's uh, object oriented. So every result from every command that you, which, which is a, a PowerShell commandlet, returns an object. It's not text that is being returned, like in most uh, bash uh, commands. They're, they're just text that you have to process. But these are objects. So if you uh, get a directory, get information about a, a directory, then the list of files and folders you will get are objects. So then you can tell an, a specific uh, uh, file. You can then run uh, get uh, when it was created or uh, make a lot of different things with it because it's an object. So that is quite a big difference between uh, PowerShell and other command prompts uh, and script planning. Uh, you also have a full action to the .NET framework. So if you want to use some part of the .NET framework, then you can use it directly into PowerShell. Um, and a lot of, <coughs> since they have this plugin system with the commandlets, it's easy, if you know <laughs> how to do them, it's easy to make own commandlets. So if you are building a, a specialized web server of sort, if you want to write uh, some commandlets to be able to manage that server, then it's quite easy to do that. And then you just have to, to load that uh, 
that commandlet or that module into PowerShell before you start to use it. <coughs> and of course, as in the other, you can work with, with objects and with variables and files and directories and the registry. And they have pre-built commandlets for most of their own services, like Active Directory and SQL Server. Uh, they have these uh, commandlets. So the same question then, <laughs> of course. Uh, how many built-in commands do you think uh, is in PowerShell? So here we have the results, and it's quite a lot, actually. Uh, I couldn't get an exact number, uh, because <laughs> when I tried to find it, I didn't. But I know it's more than 2,000, uh, so it's quite a lot. And these are quite long. <laughs> Most because they use a, a specific syntax uh, that they want uh, to use, but they have auto completion, so you don't have to type the whole commands uh, anyway. Uh, we can see, uh, well, this is his, the same for, for Windows PowerShell, the shortcuts. Uh, they are a bit different. Um, so th this is just. Uh, something that you can do, you can study afterwards. Uh, and the uh, good reads. Uh, <coughs> here, Microsoft themselves had a, a lot of good video tutorials. Uh, they can be differs from one hour to a couple of hours, uh, divided into different parts. Uh, most of, of these videos, if you look at them, are, are for a specific topic of PowerShell. They had this one of the, the <coughs> The last feature, the desired state configuration, uh, is something new, which is actually when you can specify uh, a an, an file with, I want my system to look like this. And then you can put that in to when the system starts up and boot, uh, it will look exactly like that. Uh, and that's quite a lot of links are about that uh, DSSC. Uh, so, uh, but the, the first one here, the jump start on PowerShell 3.0 is quite good. So, how do the commands differ from PowerShell to uh, Unix shell or bash? Uh, so, these are not bash commands. Uh, they can be uh, files, uh, programs that are built into the Linux system. <coughs> and in, in PowerShell, you have a lot of alias that are pre-configured. And that's because they wanted to get people from the Linux and Unix worlds to easier uh, get started with PowerShell. So as you, if, if you see a, a list command to list files and directories uh, in a folder, they will have an al alias for that. But the real command is get child items. And as you see, the, the, the command, let's have a, a specific uh, naming convention, as you can see, and they're quite long. But a lot of these are, <coughs> they have getting the aliases, uh, so you can use the same. And in the old command prompt in Windows, you used dir to a list, so they have an alias for that too. So system administrator are used to the old way, still can use that. But if you write scripts, I would really recommend that you use the full name. Because maybe that script should be used by another administrator. Then you should use the same convention, of course. So these are just some examples. Uh, and <clears throat> some may differ depending on the installation of the system, uh, of course. Like this one, invoke web request, which is to download something from the internet. Last I, I tried it, it didn't work on Windows Server Core, which is a, a way to install Windows system without the graphical interface. I thought it was quite strange why that command didn't work. How to, do you get stuff from the internet if you want to download drivers and you can't use that command? Uh, I have to look up that. <laughs> 
Um, so, which do you prefer as of now? <laughs> Maybe not after this course. Hopefully I will uh, have persuaded you to. Uh, let's see, okay. And most of you are more comfortable with the, the GUI as of now. Hopefully, hopefully, by the end of this course, you will use the you will prefer the CLI. So, post setup. Uh, this is a term that I use. I don't know if it's widely spread, but. What's included in the post setup is after you install the operating system, and then you have to do some things before you're starting to um, installing the, the real server or the real service that you want to use the system for. And before you do that, you should do some things. The first thing that you should do is install drivers and something called chipset. The chipset is uh, <coughs> from the hardware. Uh, guys who build the, the server, if it's a physical, uh, they have combined a lot of, of drivers into one package to making your uh, operating system talk to those uh, hardware, uh, the hardware in a correct manner. Uh, and then probably you have some drivers. If you have a virtualized server, then you could have, <coughs> you have probably if you're using VMware Workstation, we have VMware Tools, which is uh, an installation that make drivers to communicate with the virtualization in a better manner. In VirtualBox, it's called Editions, I think. Uh, then you just click on Install Edition, and then you will have to install uh, uh, a software to make the, the operating system talk better to, to the hardware. When you've done that, uh, you should configure the computer name. In some distribution, the computer name is uh, uh, you choose that during the installation process, but in some you don't. Then you need to configure network. You could have a DHCP server that hands out IP address and configuration in your network. You prob probably do, but if you don't, you need to configure that. And then it's always recommended to update the system. So you have the latest version of uh, security updates and stuff like that. And then look through the security. Do we have a firewall? How, how do we com configure that uh, to our likings? Uh, set up users and stuff like that on the system. So, how to rename a computer? Now, the command, I will get into some commands. I won't show you how to do it in the graphical user interface. Uh, and the main thing, uh, reason, is that it's much easier for us to make a documentation of what we have done on the system. So if the system goes down, if we have all the commands that we have been run to get making it in our desired state, then it's easier to just apply these commands again if we have to reinstall the system. So it's a sort of a documentation also of what you have done. Uh, and these differs in the different Linux distributions. And I have chosen you to show it in Ubuntu, they may apply in different distribution, uh, but if you want to do this in CentOS, then maybe it's a different command that you have to do. And on a Ubuntu system, there isn't a command to help you to do that. You have to go into some configuration files. I will talk about sudo when I talk about uh, security, <coughs> but uh, to make yourself an administrator, sort of say, uh, then you type sudo. Then you have a nano, which is a text editor. You can use Vim or V or anything you like. So that's just a program. And then is a path for a file. So that will open up nano, and you can change this file. And that file, there you have your, whole, uh, your computer name. So you can edit that file, save it. And to be able to change that, you have to be an administrator. 
that's why you have to use sudo before. Then it's recommended that you also update a file called uh, host. Uh, the next lecture I will talk about DNS, uh, how we put a uh, name into an IP address, how do we translate those. And this is, if you don't have DNS, this is the file where you can uh, make static uh, mappings between an IP address and a name. And the system will have done that for you when you install it, so the, the old name will be in that file. So you need to change that too. And then you reboot the system. You can restart the services that are responsible for the, uh, but if in this part of the setup, it's not uh, difficult to, uh, to make a, a reboot. In the Windows, you use a PowerShell command, which is remain, rename computer. And then you have an uh, argument, which is new name. Uh, and then uh, the flag restart. It will automatically restart the system. In Windows, you have to re restart the system. Because when it comes up, it will broadcast out its name on the network. So it needs to, to have a restart. Uh, when it comes to the network, uh, they look a bit different. You have if config on Linux, which stands for interface configuration, uh, and you have IP config for Windows, but you get around the same information about the network. Uh, in in uh, Linux, you also get about uh, some bits about uh, the performance now on the network. Uh, and how to configure these? In Windows, uh, you first has, uh, have to get the, the interface of which uh, network card you, you want to, to change. Then you use uh, that first command, net at h, interface ip show config, and then it will display uh, that configuration, and then you will get the name I use here. So to uh, set a static IP address, you set that command. And a static DNS server. If you want to go back to DHCP, then you use those commands. I will do this in tomorrow's uh, demo. In Ubuntu, uh, you first, <coughs> you have these files, uh, this file, etc, network interfaces, uh, which you will edit uh, to your likings. Um, and this is for a static configuration, the first uh, one. Here you can also set the DNS server uh, directly. This differs very much between Linux distributions. And most of them have another file which handles the, the DNS servers. But the Ubuntu development team wanted to make it more easy, so you do it in this file, and then when you apply these settings by the, the last command, it will update those files for you. Uh, and if you want to go back to the, the DHCP uh, configuration, you use uh, this one. And the updates when you have a network, because you need a uh, network, an internet connection uh, for most of these commands to work. You have uh, sudo apt-get update and then upgrade. The first one will just update to see what your system looks like in comparison to the latest version. And then uh, you will upgrade. In Windows, there are not uh, any PowerShell commandlets pre-installed for doing that. They have, I don't know if it's Microsoft, but someone has built commandlets for doing that, but they are not installed uh, at the beginning. But you can use a command, which is not a part of PowerShell, which is called sconfig, which has a lot of built-in commands for changing IP address, changing computer name, updating the system, a sort of help for uh, the core installation where you don't have the GUI. I don't recommend using that because you can't script it. You have to make choices in that program. Uh, so it's better probably to download the, the 
commandlets for uh, Windows Update and use those. So the final part about security. Uh, in Linux system, we talk about root. Root is the, the person who has all the authority to make changes to the system. And in Ubuntu, that account is disabled. Well, it's actually not disabled. It has a password which you don't know. It's really long, and you don't know it. Uh, and Instead, you use a, uh, a program called sudo, which makes you uh, administrator when you want to run a specific command. And you don't have to know the, the root uh, password to be able to, to use root. You have to be a part of the administrator group as a user. Uh, but you use your own password to elevate yourself to the higher level when you want to use it. But you only do that when you want to do these administrative duties, like changing the IP configuration. So if someone gets to your system and you're logged in, they have to know your password to be able to execute the commands as sudo. Uh, you can, I don't recommend it, enable the, the root account by setting a, a password for it, by doing this. But I don't know why you should do that. That is not a good idea. Uh, so to disable it, you just run that. That is the best one. <laughs> and if you want to learn more about sudo or any commands in, in Linux, you can use this man, stands for manual, and then the command name. Then not all of the, the, the commands has a man file, but most of them have that. It's quite a long file, uh, usually, uh, but it's a good read. Um, Window, PowerShell has that too. Uh, it has an alias for uh, for man. It's called get help in Windows PowerShell, uh, and I really like that help file because usually they have in the far bottom you have examples how to use the command uh, for different scenarios. Uh, that usually not included in the man file for in a Linux system. So does Windows have <coughs> something simil uh, similar to sudo? Yeah, you've probably seen the user access control dialog that comes up sometimes when you want to do things uh, that need to be elevated. So user, users usually on the Windows system are not, even if they are in the admin group, they can't uh, do administrative stuff. They will get this prompt, and you have to press yes, or you can have it set up so you have to type in your password to do those. The problem is it doesn't exist in a command prompt. Because of the command prompt itself is a program. So when you run it, you have to specify if you want to do it as an administrator or as the regular computer or a user. That's because when, uh, when you see a command prompt, you probably see the administrator colon and then the name. That will indicate that everything you do in this prompt, you will do as an elevated administrator. Uh, that's too bad, I think. It's not a good way. But that's how it is. Uh, a second part, you, you can, we can talk about security. There's a lot of stuff to cover, but we have a, a separate lecture on that in the end. Uh, this is just some main pointers. The next thing will probably be the, the firewall. Uh, there are a firewall in Linux called IP tables, which is, I don't know if it's always installed, but it's always there, I think. Uh, it's quite hard to manage uh, IP tables, a lot of config files and a lot of stuff to write. So they have made these uh, uncomplicated firewall, UFW. Uh, uh, and that is just helping you to configure IP tables. So in itself, uh, UFE is not a firewall. It uses IP tables in the background. And to my knowledge, when you install a Ubuntu server, the firewall isn't enabled by default. Uh, so my recommendation is that 
uh, as soon as possible enable it. And you do that by sudo ufb enable. Then it's enabled. And then you have to uh, say what things is allowed to come into the system. Most of the time you can get the system to get out to the internet to download things and visit web pages and stuff like that. But something from the outside to be able to come in, then you have to allow those things. And you do that by UFV allow and then the port number. So here we are allowing SSH into the system. And then you can um, get the sta status of the, the firewall by doing that last command. In Windows, we have this Windows firewall with advanced security. Uh, it comes pre-installed and is enabled in all Windows, uh, even the both servers and desktop version of Windows. Uh, they are pre-configured with some rules to uh, make the system work. Uh, and this firewall is actually three firewalls in one. Uh, they have different profiles, you can say. You have the public profile, the private profile, and the domain profile. And which one you are running, there's different rule set for, every, for each of these. So you can say in the, the public profile, we don't allow almost anything to come into the system. Uh, and when is that used? Well, if you take your computer to a network which is unknown, to the computer, it will choose the public profile for you. And then we come back to the office, and when you want to have some uh, more loosely security, you maybe trust some systems, uh, then it will make, uh, make the decision of private or domain. And how they make that is based on if you're joined in the domain, an active directory domain. We will talk about that in two or three lectures. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if the last version of PowerShell has commands for managing the firewall. If they don't, I, probably there are some commandlets that you can download. But otherwise, they have a really good command called netha, ASH, which you can control both the network and the firewall with. And it's quite easy to, to understand. So to be able to ping this computer. All the servers at default, you are not allowed to ping. You know, the command ping, to, we talked about that during uh, the network part. Uh, so if you try to ping a newly installed Windows server, it won't answer. The firewall won't allow, allow it. So you have to run this command to make it uh, accept ping. And that I would recommend that you do that, because it's a good way to know if your computer is on and if it's working. So, to sum up the today's lecture, uh, there are really important decisions that you have to make before you start the installation. Um, it's quite a big difference in management between Windows and Linux systems. Um, I would encourage you to, to choose CLI over a GUI when you manage the system. The advantages are much uh, on the CLI favor. And uh, check the firewall off the installation. It, uh, I think most of Linux system probably has that enabled when you, uh, when you install it, but some don't. And the last thing, don't be afraid of the CLI. It's very powerful. Uh, you should use it responsible. <laughs> I think in, in uh, the first time you use sudo in, in, uh, in um, OS X, you get a warning that, uh, oh, you are able to do a lot of stuff right now. Be sure that you know what you're doing. But then after that first warning, you won't get that warning again. John looks <laughs> suspicious. I have never seen that warning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> OK, any questions? Okay then, 
Uh, the students who are attending this course, we will have the little discussion afterwards in Swedish. Uh, I think we will start in five minutes. Minutes. Okay, thank you. <laughs>